Welcome everyone to our meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. We have a, an agenda before us which, we begins with, which begins with a prayer. I'll turn to Mr. O'Reilly to lead us in prayer. If you wish to experience peace, provide peace for another. If you wish to know you are safe, cause another to know that they are safe. If you wish to understand seemingly incomprehensible, seemingly incomprehensible things, help another to understand. If you wish to heal your own sadness or anger, seek to heal the sadness or anger of another. Dalai Lama. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. And just before we begin, I'll ask all committee members and members of the public that if you have a cell phone, to please uh, put it on silent for the remainder of the meeting. Committee, we have an agenda before us. Well, first of all, how about I introduce the members? Uh, today we have um, Mr. Michael Nadley, the MLA for Daycho, Mr. Kevin O'Reilly, MLA for Frame Lake, and Mr. Danny McNeely, MLA for Satu. I'm RJ Simpson, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Standing Committee on Government Operations and the MLA for Hay River North. With us we have uh, Committee Advisor, April Taylor, and Jennifer Frankie Smith, our committee clerk trainee. Uh, we have an agenda before us. Do I have a mover to adopt the agenda? Uh, Mr. McNeely, all those in favor? Agreed. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest, seeing none. We will continue with the public hearing on Bill 20. Today, the Standing Committee on Government Operations is holding a public hearing on Bill 20 Ombudsperson Act. The committee held a public meeting in DLO today at noon and will be holding meetings October 1st to 4th in Hay River, Fort Resolution, Inuvik, Norman Wells, and Bechico before it reports back to the Legislative Assembly on the proposed legislation during the October session. The Standing Committee on Government Operations is a committee of the regular members of the Legislative Assembly. The bill we are reviewing today was introduced by the government given first and second reading in the Legislative Assembly and then referred to this Standing Committee for review. It is our responsibility as a Standing Committee to consult with residents of the NWT on what they like or don't like about the bill. We would like to hear your views and comments, which we will then report back to our colleagues in this Assembly. I wish to briefly describe the intent of this bill. Bill 20, Ombudsperson Act, establishes an Ombudsperson for the Northwest Territories as an arm's length officer of the Legislature, acting on behalf of Northwest Territories residents who have concerns about how they are treated in their dealings with the Government of the Northwest Territories. The Ombudsperson will have broad investigative powers to determine if the GNWT, including its boards and agencies, is conducting its business according to established laws, policies, and principles of procedural fairness. The Ombudsperson will also have the authority to make non-binding recommendations to the GNWT to improve its legislation, policies and procedures. Bill 20 is of particular interest to this committee, which has long supported the creation of an Ombudsperson for the Northwest Territories. Regular members advocated for the inclusion of this initiative in the GNWT's mandate, including Ms. Wendy Bezero, who is a strong advocate for this work in her former capacity as a member of the Legislative Assembly and who is with us here this evening. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Minister of Public Engagement and Transparency, the Honourable Louis Siebert, and his Cabinet colleagues for the introduction of this bill, which represents the culmination of a great deal of planning and periodic discussions dating back to the 12th Assembly. In 2014, our predecessor committee in the 17th Assembly tabled a report on establishing an office of the Ombudsperson for the Northwest Territories. Copies of that table document are provided for those who wish to know more about how the Ombudsperson serves the public in governments across Canada. As well, there are copies of the bill and they're both on the side table. You're welcome to help yourself. I'd like, to share your, I'd like you to share your views with us today. Please let the clerk know if, uh, you have, uh, if you would like to present to committee. They'll be sure to get you on the list. We'll also accept written submissions by postal mail or email until Monday, October 8th, 2018 at 5 p.m. One final piece of housekeeping, please remember that all submissions will be part of the official committee records and may be reflected in our final report. Any submissions made during this meeting may also be televised or broadcast via social media. Thank you for, to everyone for your patience during this introduction. With members' agreement, can we now open the floor to public submission? Members, do you agree? Thank you, Commission. We have a list started. The first is Deneen Everett, the Executive Director of the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce. Please uh, approach the witness stand. 
Uh, the microphone will be controlled by our tech person, so you don't have to touch any buttons. And you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Deneen Everett, and I'm the executive director for the Yellowknife uh, Chamber of Commerce. Fundamentally, the Yellowknife Chamber has long held the belief that the government of the Northwest Territories should have transparency and open government policies that are consistent with or exceed that of other Canadian jurisdictions. In a written submission made as part of the community consultations for the creation of an open government policy, the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce made requests for the following. The establishment of an office of the ombudsperson to be appointed by the legislature and completely independent of the executive. The creation of a lobbyist registry that is publicly accessible online. A typical lobbyist registry applies to ministers, regular MLAs, and senior bureaucrats, and includes meetings, phone calls, and emails. And the creation of a Whistleblower Protection Act. We are very, very excited to see Bill 20, the Ombudsperson Act, moving forward. However, we feel the Act is missing uh, one key component. The Act fails to provide the Ombudsperson with jurisdiction over municipalities, something that exists in most other Canadian provinces and territories, including Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, British Columbia, Alberta, and even the Yukon. The Ombudsperson for British Columbia has had jurisdiction over municipalities since 1995. Um, and other provincial governments have made amendments in response to the high volume of complaints received. Uh, for example, during the 2015-2016 year, there were 504 files um, in British Columbia. And then in Ontario, there was 1,656 complaints made, which incentivized the government to amend their legislation in 2016. Alberta reported that they were receiving a significant number of complaints um, before their ombudsperson was given jurisdiction over municipalities, which occurred recently, um, April 1st of 2018. We urge the government of the Northwest Territories to get this right the first time and ensure that the Ombudsperson Act follows Canadian best practices and has the same authority as other Canadian provinces and territories. Creating a culture of open government and accountability is an important issue for the Yellowknife business community. We sincerely hope to see a recommendation that would provide our ombudsperson with jurisdiction to investigate complaints received at the municipal level. Thank you. Thank you very much for that submission. I'll open the floor to committee. If committee has any questions, if they'd like any further clarification. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Everett, you, you mentioned a written submission. Is, was this, um, uh, do we have a copy of the, the submission? You can also check it out on our website, ykchamber.com. Okay. It's uh, posted up there. All right, I great. believe it was sent to, um, uh, to the Premier and Minister Siebert. Okay, uh, yeah, in, in situations like this, um, the, uh, it would be good to send the correspondence directly to the committee clerk, so we'll have our clerk arrange with you to, uh, to deliver that, uh, that letter so the committee can um, consider it in its report. Perfect. Anything further from committee? Nothing further? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Everett. Uh, we appreciate your submission. Thank you. Next on our list, we have... Ms. Wendy Bizarro, representing the NWT Senior Society. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask the witnesses to introduce themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, with I'm Wendy Bezero. I'm a member of the uh, Yellowknife Senior Society, and I'm an alternate board member on the NWT Senior Society. And with me is the Executive Director of the NWT Senior Society, Suzette Montreuil. Thank you very much, and welcome back, Ms. Bezero, to the, the other side of the table. Yeah. <laughs> Please proceed with your presentation. The room hasn't changed much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the Senior Society wishes to thank you for the opportunity to prevent the views of this organization. And it's an organization that represents the interests of about 8,000 older adults in the NWT. We're pleased to address you about this initiative, the, uh, the Bill 20, that will provide another venue for older adults to assert their rights and seek fair and just rulings on the administration of programs. 
According to the Associations of Ombudsperson, an Ombudsperson Act should be assessed using four criteria. These are independence, impartiality and fairness, credibility of the review process, and confidentiality. <clears throat> the NWT Senior Society has reviewed the proposed Bill 20, Ombudsperson Act, and will make comments to support clauses that affirm these criteria or challenge clauses that do not. In general comments, to begin, all references to the Legislative Assembly should be clarified to confirm that a substantive or supermajority is in favour of appointment or suspension. The decision to use a supermajority would help to assure the independence of the office and show broad support for any action related to the office of the Ombudsperson. Use of a supermajority also confirms impartiality of appointment. Secondly, the Act stipulates that the Ombudsperson does not make binding orders. There is some controversy, controversy on this issue, but after some investigation on our part, we determined that this is appropriate. While the Ombudsperson has extensive powers to obtain information and investigate acts, the fact that it does not make binding orders relieves the need for an option to take a decision of the Ombudsperson to a Court of Appeal. This ensures the efforts of the Ombudsperson are not diverted to cover litigation. Instead, the Ombudsperson relies on moral persuasion, the credibility of its review and the fact that government agencies are more likely to act effectively if they are persuaded rather than forced. However, the Act and the GNWT must affirm the importance of the recommendations of the Office of the Ombudsperson. To review the Act, Clause 4, Appointment of Ombudsperson. It is appropriate that the Legislative Assembly provide a recommendation for the appointment. The appointment process should also enumerate qualifications for choosing a well-qualified and broadly supported candidate that is sensitive to Indigenous issues. It should also state that a substantive majority approved of the recommendation as mentioned before. Clause 5, Term of Office. <clears throat> the Act supports a term of five years for the Ombudsperson that exceeds the mandate of any Legislative Assembly. This helps to ensure the work of the office is not unduly influenced by the Legislative Assembly once appointed. Section 2 allows for reappointment, which also helps to support the stability of the office. Clause 6.2, suspension or removal for cause or incapacity. Any measure for removal should show that a substantive majority was in favour and not a simple majority. This again is to ensure that the Ombudsperson is independent and cannot be removed at the whim of a few due to, the, due to a decision that may be unpopular. Clause 7, 1 and 2, the same recommendation to use a supermajority is suggested for these sections. Clause 7, Section 3, Acting Ombudsman and 8, uh, 1, Special Ombudsperson. These clauses leave the appointment of an Acting or Special Ombudsperson up to the Commissioner and the Speaker. This could create a situation of undue influence. The NWT Senior Society would recommend that the clause be modified to include, quote, on the recommendation of the Legislative Assembly, end quote. Clause 9, Remuneration and Expenses. This clause indicates the remuneration will be determined by the Board of Management. It's important that the rate of pay recognize that the Ombudsperson will investigate and make recommendations to the highest officials of the government and that he or she is paid according to this level of responsibility. The salary should be fixed so it cannot be reduced while the Ombudsperson is in office, presenting any form of punishment for actions taken, that is, unless all government officials' salaries are reduced. Clause 10.1, Other Employment. This clause allows the Ombudsperson to hold another office or carry on a trade, business or profession. The NWT Senior Society does not agree with this clause. Outside income or job requirements could be used to influence the work of the Ombudsperson and should be prohibited as it could decrease both the independence and the impartiality of the Ombudsperson. The possibility of assigning an Ombudsperson from another jurisdiction initially is possible but eventually this office will require that the Ombudsperson be available on a full-time basis. Clause 10.2, Ineligibility. This clause does not permit the Ombudsperson to be nominated for election. It is appropriate that the Ombudsperson be independent and not appear to serve the agenda of the Legislative Assembly or government leaders. Clause 11, Not a member of the public service. This is an appropriate clause as it assures the impartiality of the office. Clause 12, Ombudsperson employees. It is essential that the Ombudsperson has the sole power to appoint and remove staff, as the work is sensitive and the Ombudsperson must have confidence in the staff. Clause 13, Oath, Oath, Oath of Office Ombudsperson. This clause starts to establish the importance of confidentiality. Clause 14, Submission of Financial Estimates. 
It is important that the Office of the Ombudsperson be funded at a level sufficient to carry out the mandate of the Act and to provide thorough investigations. This is further supported in the ability to the Ombudsperson to submit a special request to the Board of Management if the amounts provided are, in in are inadequate. Clause 15.1, Mandate. This clause states that the Ombudsperson is to investigate any decision or recommendation made or any act done or remitted to be done by an authority with respect to a matter of administration. It appears to imply that the work covers only what exists in the policy and not the nature of the policy itself. In the process of reviewing a complaint, the Ombudsperson may arrive at conclusions that a policy should be reviewed to solve problems or prevent them from happening again. The Act should allow this. Clause 15.2, commencing investigation. While most investigations will arise from complaints, the authority to self-initiate an investigation when the ombudsperson has information warranting an investigation, even without a complaint, is valuable and important. 15.3, powers paramount. This clause rightfully allows the ombudsperson to exercise powers or duties despite provisions in other acts. 15.5, public edu education. This office will have a duty to help the public understand the scope and limitation of its work, specifically the need to go through any existing appeal processes prior to an investigation by the Ombudsperson and the fact it does not, does not make binder orders. 16, Sections 1 and 2, Referral by the Legislative Assembly. The creation of an Ombudsperson office will be a great tool for the Legislative Assembly and Executive to resolve matters that require investigation and an outside objective evaluation. Jurisdiction of the Ombudsperson, this clause allows the, sorry, Clause 17. This clause allows the common practice of not giving the Ombudsperson jurisdiction over those who appoint them, namely elected officials or over judges. It also affirms the need to use any existing right to appeal prior to the involvement of the Ombudsperson, unless it would be unreasonable to expect the complainant to pursue that recourse. Clause 18, one, confidentiality. Confidentiality may be important for the complainant and the right to confidentiality should be protected. 18, two, disclosure by the ombudsperson. The ombudsperson should not have to investigate if disclosure is necessary to establish grounds for conclusion when the complainant requests confidentiality. This should be specified in the act. Clause 23, complaint in writing. This clause should consider not only that a complaint in writing is warranted, but that the complainant is able to perform this task. Low literacy levels or other issues may prevent the possibility of a written submission. Section, uh, clause 21, definition of restricted complainant. This clause confirms the possibility of restricted complainant being able to make a complaint without interference. This is important to older adults in the NWT who are in residential care. Clause 22, refusal to investigate. It is appropriate that the ombudsperson have the right to not investigate after careful consideration, but is required to explain this decision to complainant and authority. Clause 24, section four, requested consultation. This clause requires the ombudsperson consult with the minister before forming a final opinion. This is acceptable as long as no undue influence is attempted. Clause 26, power to obtain information and hold hearings. This is an appropriate clause that establishes the right of the ombudsperson to gather all the information required to carry out a thorough investigation. It adds credibility to the review process. It might be important to state the amount of time that must be provided to the administrative head before entering any premise. Clause 27, 2B, opportunity to make representations. This clause provides a fair and democratic opportunity for an authority to present their side of the event and should help to make the existence of an ombudsperson more acceptable to the public service. Clause 28, Minister of Justice may restrict investigative powers. This is a sensitive clause that aims to protect the work of the Executive Council, but could provide too much authority to the Minister of Justice. The reporting of the actions of the Minister to the Legislative Assembly provides some measure of control, as does the ability of the Ombudsperson to apply to the Supreme Court for determination if action by the Minister was justified. Sec uh, clause 30, Protection for Compliance. This clause is essential as it offers protection for anyone who carries out the recommendations of the Ombudsperson. This also points to the high level of authority of the Office. Clause 33, Report after Investigation. This clause appropriately names the number of ways a decision may be wrong and provides a wide scope for the ombudsperson. It also provides a thorough list of recommendations the ombudsperson can make. 
Several of these recommendations clearly go beyond the administration of a policy, as previously mentioned. 37, report if no suitable action taken. Clauses 34 to 36 explain the various steps the ombudsperson can take if the recommendations are not addressed. Clause 37 indicates the ombudsperson may submit a report to the Premier and subsequently may submit a report to the Legislative Assembly. As this is the final level of action to be taken, it would be more appropriate to have both the Premier and the Legislative Assembly advised of non-action by an authority. The Legislative Assembly is the body that appointed the ombudsperson and affirms the level of authority of the office. Clause 38, authority may reconsider decision. This clause is somewhat unclear. It should be clarified to indicate that the decision in question is one that the authority had taken prior to the recommendation of the ombudsperson. Clause 39.2, limitation of ability. The protection of ombudsperson and staff supports the independence of the office and the credibility of the review process. Clause 43, annual report. The preparation of an annual report will strengthen the accountability of the office and maintain a relationship with the Legislative Assembly. The NWT seniors support the approval of the Ombudsperson Act and has offered these suggestions to build a stronger act that will serve the needs of older adults and the general public of the NWT. Thank you for your attention to our recommendations. We're pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bissero, and uh, thank you to the NWT Senior Society. Uh, my name is Karen Tester. I'm the member of Cam Lake and chair of the committee. I thank my deputy for getting the meeting started. Unfortunately, I was away on child care responsibilities. Um, does any one a member of the committee have questions for our witnesses? Uh, I have a few. Um, you mentioned, uh, I'll just find the right section, the suspension of removal or clause for, or cause for incapacity. Um, your recommendation is a substantive majority is required, and in the other sections when you're talking about um, ensuring there's an adequate majority, it's always the use of supermajority. So is there a difference between what you're recommending here versus your recommendations for supermajority votes for, for appointment and removal? Uh, this would be six uh, bracket two on page two of your submission. Do you want to respond to that? I'll, I'll ask uh, yeah, Ms. Matre. So the position of the NWT Senior Society is that uh, both the appointment and the suspension, particularly for cause, um, should be done by a substantive majority because that uh, shows a wide support for the decision. And the substantive majority is also indicated in the uh, any review of Ombudsperson Act, so it's an important concept. It's sort of like when a board um, wants to change a bylaw, they have to have a two-thirds majority. It's that kind of, of uh, situation. So you'd recommend a two-thirds majority? Absolutely. Okay. Well, we didn't say two-thirds, but that's a common definition yeah, for a supermajority, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, under <coughs> number 20, uh, or clause 20, brackets three, that's on page four. Um, you've expressed concerns around the literacy capabilities of complaints that are provided in writing. How do you see um, a modification to the bill to better serve the needs of people whose literacy might be limited? You, Go ahead, Ms. Montreux. Thank you for the question. Um, you could ask a service officer or someone to assist the client. That could be... Uh, uh, and I'm taking that idea actually from uh, Ms. B. Suro because I think it's a really good idea. Um, certainly, we have nothing against written complaints, but we don't want to be that to be a criteria that eliminates access to the use of the ombudsperson for someone who may find that difficult. Okay, thank you. <coughs> and yes, oh, Ms. Peter, go ahead. My apologies. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, just to, to follow up a bit, I think um, I sort of assumed that uh, many of those details would be handled in regulations. Um, but the, the point that's being made here is, is I, I don't think it necessarily has to be in the Act, but committee needs to make sure that it gets properly dealt with in regulations. I think that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beecher. Um, 
So if you could just explain your concerns around uh, section 15 brackets one, the mandate, uh, that's on page three. Um, my my read of the bill is, uh, you know, although the the ombudsperson is limited to review policy, things in policy or law, um, that their recommendations could be of the nature that uh, recommend changes to that policy or recommend new policies around whatever they're reviewing. Do, do you have a different interpretation of the way the act is currently worded? Yes, please, Rowe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I, I do not. I, I think it's the language in the bill, which mm -hmm. is a bit of a concern. Okay. Um, um, it um, states, investigate any decision or recommendations made or any act done or omitted to be done by an authority. There's no reference there to process, to procedure, to policy. And without that reference, it could be stated that the ombudsperson has no authority to go and look into that aspect of, of a, what a department has done. And, you know, many of the uh, complaints that are going to be brought forward are likely going to be due to a process or a procedure or a policy. So I think it's the lack of mention of anything other than that, which is a concern. Ms. Montreuil? Yes, if I could add. Wait, uh, Ms. Sorry, it, just Ms. Montreuil. Go ahead. If I could add, because it, it continues to say with respect to a matter of administration, so that's right. the part that makes it sound like it's only this is the policy and the complaint has to be about how it was administered, not whether there's a, uh, the policy has integrity or um, is not the cause of the problem. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. <coughs> that uh, concludes my questions. Are there any more from committee? All right. Well, thank you very much thank for you. your evidence. We will take that into consideration as we continue our review of the bill. Thank you. We could have the... Mr. Colin Bale. You just uh, when you're ready to go, just introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your uh, evidence. Mr. Chair, are we ready to proceed? Yes. Thank you. I wish to thank the Standing Committee on Government Operations for the opportunity to provide my comments on Bill 20, the Ombudsperson Act. It was in, er, in the early 1990s that I first addressed before a committee of this House the need for then Ombudsman legislation. In the intervening 25 years, I've had a moment or two to further reflect on the need for this jurisdiction's legislation in this regard. As this committee is aware, we're one of only two jurisdictions without such legislation. I wish to speak to nine particular sections of the proposed act for which I encourage reconsideration. But before I do, I would like to speak briefly about the intended scheme of uh, the Ombudsperson legislation. Ombudsperson legislation at its core is not intended to reprimand government, but rather to assist individuals with resolving disputes they may have with government and how they've been treated during that interaction. To my mind, this can best be achieved using a restorative approach rather than an adjudicative one. In doing so, individuals can have their faith restored in the public sector, and the government can be assisted in providing and promoting a fair, accountable, transparent services to the public. It's not enough for the ombudsperson to find fault and recommend changes. While collaborative and informative dispute resolution is contemplated in the proposed act, it will fall to the ombudsperson to determine how best to resolve complaints. To this end, the introduction of a purpose section to the act 
would help guide stakeholders and the ombudsperson in using less determinative approaches and more collaborative and restorative approaches whenever possible. Examples of a purpose section can be found in both the Workers' Compensation Act and the Human Rights Act. As demonstrated by other jurisdictions, the ombudsperson is most often the only or last means of resolving disputes with government agencies. The trust placed in the ombudsperson by the public and the statutory authority given to that individual by the Legislative Assembly carries great responsibility and expectation. During this committee's deliberation, I encourage you to place yourself simultaneously in the shoes of three individuals. The first individual who feels that they've been wrongly treated by the actions or decisions of a government official, you feel powerless. Your life has been adversely impact, impacted and you have nowhere to seek assistance or redress. Secondly, place yourself in the shoes of the, a government employee. You are following the procedures and the rules you've been instructed to follow. You had no choice but to make the decision you did. Lastly, put yourself in the shoes of the ombudsperson. What authorities, tools, processes, skills, experience should you have available to help these individuals? Because in the end, it's your job to help both and to leave the government program a fair, more accountable, and more transparent program for all. I would now like to refer you to uh, the, the materials um, I've submitted. The first three pages are a summary of what I'll be speaking about. The legal size documents, the appendix at the back is a comparator between uh, Bill 20 the draft act that was tabled in 2015 and four other jurisdictions. The first section of Bill 20 I would like to address is section 10 sub 1. And it deals with the ombudsperson being able to concurrently hold another office or engage in outside business with the consent of the speaker. Other jurisdictions do not allow the ombudsperson to hold other offices or carry on outside business. This prohibition is intended to ensure full commitment to the duties and to reduce possible conflicts of interest. The only possible reasoning to have this in is the view that the ombudsperson's position is not going to be full time. I would disagree with that position. Should this ability, however, remain, it's respectfully suggested that it be the conflict of interest commissioner and not the speaker that provides approval. The conflict of interest commissioner is better positioned to evaluate, evaluate appropriateness and potential conflict. The second item is section 15, subsection 1 and I refer to the term matter of administration or a similar one is used in many jurisdictions while others have excluded it. My concern with the inclusion is that it may be seen as a limitation on the authority of the ombudsperson where the actions of a government official may be viewed as being outside a matter of administration within the gray area between government business and personal. We all live in small communities where the, there are inevitable interactions between civil servants and residents. Where these interactions result in allegations of a, uh, asserting undue influence or conflict of interest, would it not be in everyone's interest to have available an impartial investigator to resolve the dispute? My recommendation would be to remove the term with respect to matter of administration. That would certainly broad, broaden the jurisdiction of the ombudsperson. The third item, the third section is 17 sub 1. 
This draft section excludes all members and staff of the Legislative Assembly from Ombudsperson jurisdiction. I have found one other jurisdiction, that being Man Manitoba, with a similar restriction. All others include the Legislative Assembly within the Ombudsperson's jurisdiction. I agree with the draft section to the extent that the deliberations and processes, procedures of the Executive Council should be rightly excluded. However, the conduct of individual members, management and staff of the Legislative Assembly should not be outside the Ombudsperson's jurisdiction. Doing so suggests to the public the members and staff of the Legislative Assembly are above such scrutiny. The Legislative Assembly is bound by human rights legislation. Should it not also be bound by the legislation intended to assist citizens with concerns about how they've been dealt with by individual members or staff of the Legislative Assembly? I would encourage this committee to consider extending that accountability while protecting the legitimate deliberations and proceedings of the Executive Council. The fourth section is also 17 sub 1. It is universal to all ombudsperson's legislation that an ombudsperson has no jurisdiction where there is a right of appeal. What is missing from Bill 20, however, is the universal exemption that where the time for making an appeal or judicial review application has expired. A person may then make a complaint to the ombudsperson. The way Bill 20 presently reads is that only if an individual exercises the right of appeal may a complaint be made to the ombudsperson. It is suggested this section be amended to include the right to make a complaint after the time of appeal has expired. That would certainly be in keeping with all other jurisdictions I've looked at. The fifth item is section 23. This section limits the jurisdiction of the ombudsperson where a complaint falls under the mandate of a commission or commissioner. Bill 20, however, does not define the terms commission or commissioner. The intent is likely to mean statutory officers such as the language commissioner and not organizations such as the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission. In order to remove any uncertainty, it is recommended that se this section identify either the commissions and commissioners to which the section applies specifically or replace the, the, uh, these terms with statutory officers of the Legislative Assembly. The sixth item is 39 sub 3. This section prohibits the ombudsperson from being compelled to give evidence before a court. The phrase, any proceeding of a judicial nature refers only to court proceedings. The intention of this section is clear, but does not go far enough. This section does not prohibit the ombudsperson from being compelled to give evidence before an adjudicative administrative tribunal, such as the Human Rights Adjudication Panel or an Employment Standards Adjudicator. There are very good reasons why the ombudsperson should not be called to give evidence before the courts. These same reasons apply to why the ombudsperson should not be called to give evidence before an adjudicative administrative tribunal. Several such tribunals have the power to subpoena. This section should be amended to include proceedings before adjudicative administrative tribunals. The next three items uh, sections are more along the lines of omissions. Number seven is, uh, deals with section 15 sub one, the mandate of the ombudsperson. The authorities to which Bill 20 will apply is found in the schedule. It does not include any municipal or local governments. 
All of the jurisdictions I've reviewed include municipal and local governments within the jurisdiction of each jurisdiction's ombudsperson. The most frequent and impactful interactions most citizens have with government is often at the municipal level. It can be a source of conflict from which there is no means by which a resident can seek meaningful intervention. I would encourage this committee to consider inclusion of municipal and local governments, or at least set a schedule for such inclusion one year after the Act comes into force. Number eight, uh, section 22 sub one. Bill 20 outlines several circumstances where the ombudsperson may refuse or cease an investigation. From my experience in dealing with complaints made to various tribunals, it's not unheard of for a complainant to stop pursuing their complaint. This can happen for several reasons. People move away, they change their mind, they lose interest in the matter. This section does not provide for the ombudsperson to cease investigating a complaint where the complainant abandons the, com the complaint. I would recommend abandonment be added as a circumstance where the ombudsperson may cease investigating a complaint. I've provided you with uh, BC statutory wording for such a provision. Finally, number nine, section 13.3. This section limits the ombudsperson's jurisdictions to events after the act comes into force. This section uses the term conduct. However, this is the only section in the bill that conduct is used in this context. It suggested conduct be replaced with more consistent language, such as any decision, recommendation, act, order, or, or omission done by an authority. Subject to any questions the committee has, that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bale. Um, we appreciate your diligence on uh, this matter. It's uh, good to see so much thought being put into the proposed legislation. Um, So just to, just to clarify, my, our eagle-eyed researcher has just noted that in your submission you refer to the draft act. Are you referring to Bill 20 or are you referring to the draft act that was tabled October 1st in 2015? Mr. Bale? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I may have inadvertently used the terms Bill 20 and draft act incorrectly. Uh, when I use the term uh, draft legislation, I was referring to the table document, uh, excuse me, the document tabled on October 1st, 2015. And in the appendix, you will note uh, under the column, under the third column, it says draft act. And, and that too refers to the, uh, to the table document from October 1st, 2015. Thank you, Mr. Bale, for that clarification. Um, uh, your recommendation under uh, number nine is um, uh, on the conduct or uh, decision recommendation act order or mission done prior to um, the commencement of this act. Uh, is that, s from your review of other ombudsman legislation, is that consistent from, from what you presented to us, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba? Mr. Bale? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Most other jurisdictions, when describing um, the mandate, and this same language is used in Section 15.1, the mandate of the Ombudsperson is to investigate any decision or recommendation made or any act done or omitted to be done by an authority. So by using the word conduct in, in this uh, context, 
it doesn't speak to what the ombudsperson would normally investigate. That's very clear in the mandate. It's any decision, recommendation, act, order, or omission done by. So by inserting the term conduct, it changes uh, what the ombudsperson cannot investigate. So it, it's more a, a legislative drafting issue, I would suggest, <laughs> that um, the term should be, should be replaced. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bale. Um, there is a section uh, of the current, of Bill 20, what's being proposed, that does allow, in a roundabout way, the ombudsman to abandon a complaint, and I'll just find the exact language. Um, so it's under section 22, brackets 1, sub I, I, and it, oh, sorry, sub F, sub I, I, and, uh, that having regard to all the circumstances of the case, further investigation is unnecessary. Do you feel that that's sufficient to address your concerns around abandonment? Mr. Mr. Bale, go ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I do not uh, feel that, that that would encompass abandonment. That having regard to all circumstances in the case, further investigation is unnecessary. Should a complaint be made that on the face has merit, how would the ombudsperson determine that just because the complainant is no longer in contact, that investigation is unnecessary? I would suggest it, it, would, it would be stretching the ombudsperson's jurisdiction to try and squeeze abandonment and determine that it, further investigation is unnecessary. It may very well be necessary, and in fact, the ombudsman may, regardless of whether it's been abandoned or not, uh, choose to continue to investigate on, on his or her own. So I, I would suggest that uh, uh, 21 f 2 would not encompass abandonment. Thank you very much for that clarification. Are there any quest other questions from committee? Mr. McNeely? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Bale, for your, your well put together uh, submission with uh, highlighted changes. I just want you to give me an example. Uh, the, the Chamber previously said to have jurisdiction, change to have jurisdiction over municipalities. I represent five of the 33 communities, and <clears throat> I'm trying to visualize what this person would do over and above the decisions made by the mayor and councillors. Could you share what your example would be? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. So that would be recommendation uh, number seven. Mr. Number Bell? seven, excuse me. That's all right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, for several jurisdictions, in fact, most jurisdictions do include municipalities. Uh, a good chunk of the ombudsperson's work is dealing with municipal issues. Uh, this could be anything from council conducting in-camera meetings when they shouldn't be held in camera. An individual can complain, but it's likely not to go anywhere because the council has made their decision. Well, if the council doesn't have statutory authority to discuss a certain thing in camera, then an individual could come to the ombudsperson and say, that's right, this, this item should not have been discussed in camera. Uh, it goes from there to the other end of the spectrum um, that encompasses how individuals are being treated by Hamlet Town City employees. Uh, someone goes in to pay their property tax and they're treated very poorly. They take that to council, the council dismisses it. This gives the individual an opportunity to further uh, have that complaint dealt with. So there, it, 
provides another layer of oversight as it does over all government activity. Does, does that get to where your, your question, sir? Mr. McNeely? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. That provides me with an ideal example of how this individual provide oversight at the, in the municipalities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Anything further from committee? Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I want to thank um, Mr. Bale for his presentation, and um, it's good to have some constructive suggestions in writing about improving it. Um, obviously, you've looked at how this legislation stacks up against some other jurisdictions. Uh, in general, how do you think it does stack up? Uh, did, have, did you have a chance to look at the Yukon legislation? Um, I'm just curious to get sort of your, your assessment, overall your impressions. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Reilly, Mr. Bell. Thank you, sir. I've, in the appendix, I've noted four comparator jurisdictions. Uh, I couldn't find paper large enough to include many more than that. I did look at other legislation. Overall and generally, I found that uh, Bill 20 does what it's supposed to do. And I was frankly quite pleased with the final result other than some, some tweaking. There are two large holes though, however, and that is um, the issue of municipalities and local government and the Legislative Assembly. Other than that, I'm, I'm quite pleased and, and uh, it's been so long coming <laughs> that I encourage you in your work tremendously. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vail. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Anything further? Seeing nothing further, thank you very much for your evidence, Mr. Vail. We'll take it into consideration as we continue <coughs> our review of Bill 20. You may be excused. Thank you. So we have no one else on the witness list, uh, but we will allow other people. Mr. Lacelsi, come forward, please. Was Was Lasu, is that better? <laughs> if you can uh, introduce yourself for the record and. Maybe sure. you, put, you put your name correctly uh, said on the record as well. Oh, Mr. Chair, that first version was pretty good, actually. Uh, so I, I'm David Wiseltsu. Um Thank you very much to the committee for, for having this meeting. It's, it's uh, an important bill, and it's good to have sort of public consultation a and to point out that you're traveling around talking about it, which is also great to see, since uh, often there, there isn't the budget or the time for that sort of thing. Um, the, the speakers before me got into quite a bit of detail, and I won't re rehash some of those things but I wanted to point out uh, some, minor, some minor notes and things that could be done to strengthen the bill. Um, one of the things uh, we, we talked about earlier from earlier witnesses was remuneration. And right now, simply the act states that uh, a salary be paid, uh, determined by uh, Board of Management. Uh, one thing that's come up, even with uh, the Elections Act, is that there isn't a specified salary. So most jurisdictions for legislative officers of, of the House do specify it, they link it to government senior management, to a judge, to something else uh, independent so that it's clear what that, that salary is. And in the interest of, uh, of open government and, and disclosure of these things, um, I think that's an important piece um, to start professionalizing uh, appointments from the House and, and simply specifying what level that salary is at. Um, at the same time, um, just, just noting the way sort of government structures and government works, uh, linking that to a, a senior enough position um, does also confer some extra authority and, and some additional uh, piece that way. So I think it, it would be good to see that specified in the act, um, what that salary would be. Um, one other piece, uh, we heard quite a bit about the, the need for super majorities um, for appointment, revocation, anything like that. And, and I completely agree with that. Uh, but one piece that's in the act that, that isn't there is that it allows for reappointment to the position. And while it's quite common, I mean, we've had a, an access to information commissioner for quite a number of years and with reappointments, um, in this situation with an ombudsman, I think that also uh, opens the, the position and their decisions up to politics. 
Um, so if you have a, an ombudsperson that, that can be reappointed, um, it, it also leaves them open to making decisions that could be in the best interest of, of them furthering uh, the position. And now hopefully that wouldn't be the case, uh, but a really easy way to get around that would simply say that you, have, you can serve one term and one term only. And whether the, the importance of that is taking it from five to say seven years to make it a longer appointment, that, that's certainly reasonable. Um, but I think allowing a single term or, or a single extension, some sort of limit on that, um, is certainly a way of ensuring that independence for that office rather than allowing um, someone in that office to have any, any politics sort of creep into it. Uh, and it's good that there's also um, that extra layer of, of guaranteed independence. Um, uh, as related to all of that, um, the ombudsman function is a very important one. And I know uh, this committee, uh, previous assemblies have had lots to say about ombudsmen. Uh, and you look at some of the examples in other jurisdictions and uh, it can be quite a well-resourced function, and it does require a fair number of resources. Uh, if you have a single person investigating hundreds of government decisions in a year, um, it's not feasible, and frankly, I, I think all of you MLAs attempt to do that very function uh, to some degree yourselves and probably hit a bit of a wall. Um, so it's important that the office be uh, sort of reasonably resourced uh, and make sure that it does have those resources uh, to actually to, to do the job properly. Uh, one concern with the decision-making authority um, that, that's in there is that the, right now the ombudsman make recommendations to government. Um, while moral suasion is, a, is an excellent goal and, and a good way of moving along government, um, we see another example of that with the Access to Information Commissioner, where through, through moral suasion, um, decisions of the commissioner are meant to encourage the government to be more open and, and disclose more information. Um, based on reports over the last any number of years, more fingers than I have, um, that moral suasion doesn't seem to work all that well. Um, and that's just a bit of a concern. If we're gonna, gonna do this, it would make sense to do it the right way. Um, you know, there's been talk of access to information commissioners across Canada being given binding powers and how that would work. Um, there's a review of the Access to Information Act uh, ongoing, um, and it would be at least worth consideration of what difference that would make and how that would actually function. You'd hate to see a fun, uh, an office like this, an ombudsman, have an annual report each year that said, here's all the problems we found, and not many things got changed. Um, that would just be a, a real frustrating waste, and um, considering this has been a few decades in the making, uh, it would be pretty disappointing as an outcome. Uh, one other, another piece to it is the, the combination of roles. I know when it was first envisioned in the 90s, there was some talk that the official languages commissioner and an ombudsperson um, could be combined. There was talk of the Access to Information Commissioner and this being combined. And I think there's some, uh, the, the one piece uh, in the Act allowing the, the, co the commissioner or the ombudsperson to hold other p appointments uh, presumably leaves it open to that. Um, and that's great. Um, but rather than simply leaving it open to that, I think it's worthy of some consideration to actually change other legislation and say this, if the Legislative Assembly is going to reconsider uh, the structure of appointed officers um, to actually make those fixed changes. Um, so if, if there's some real consideration being given to merging the access to information uh, commissioner role with the ombudsperson or the Official Languages Act commissioner, uh, that should be specified in the legislation, not simply as a, as a secondary appointment, uh, because like um, some of the speakers before me have said, uh, this is probably going to end up being a full-time job. Uh, I, it'd be pretty surprising if this wasn't. And if it wasn't, um, well, then you may as well combine it with the other rules anyway. Uh, it would make some sense. Um, but, you know, there's certain concerns about creep of positions. So the Legislative Assembly, there's, there's continual, uh, you know, expansion of duties, expansion of positions and, and money. And, you know, there's only so many public dollars to go around. So rather than three under-resourced offices, uh, seem, seemingly much better to have one well-resourced office that could, that could accomplish everything. Um, you know, com combined with that, uh, w one last piece about uh, the public getting help. Um, the real consideration needs to be given uh, from the Legislative Assembly as, as to how it will both resource and uh, the office and educate people about this function. It'd be great um, to make sure that there's outreach offices available in other communities, um, that it's not just about where the commission is located, um, in whatever city the, the commissioner, the ombudsperson is, but it, it depends on how that other outside assistance is provided. If there's an expectation that the public could use, say, government service officers, which is a, a great resource and a great avenue, it's really hard to do that and maintain that independence. 
So I think there needs to be some real consideration from the House as to how that will work. And this shouldn't be about uh, the government quite figuring that out. Um, but it's a duty for the House to figure out how to both educate the public as to what the difference of going through the Ombudsperson will be, but also how to support that. Um, if you ask people to go to a, a government office to get help dealing with an independent office, um, that will blur a whole lot of lines and get confusing really fast. Uh, on the same lines, uh, there, there's quite a bit of education um, that could be required to under, for people to understand the split between the ombudsperson and MLAs and, and government appeals processes and, and all of those. Um, you know, in, in the end result of this is people come to their MLA the way they currently do, and MLAs have quite a bit of access to whatever ministers and departments, and then also go with the ombudsperson and create that whole, and create a process there. Um, we're not saving any resources, you're not maximizing, you're just doubling up. Um, so figuring out how that, uh, the political process will work with um, a review by the, by the ombudsman. Um, you know, that was it. I just think it's important that while well, this goes in place, it gets in place the right way. And that consideration for, uh, for the public and for use of, of the ombudsperson is, uh, is a really important factor in this, um, since it can't just be a title. It's got to be, if it's going to be created, it has to actually have the ability uh, to accomplish something and to make sure that the government is there uh, to do what it should and serve the people. So thank you very much, committee. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Wasalski. Any questions from committee? Yes, Mr. Rowe. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks to Mr. Celsius for taking the time to come here this evening. Um, I'm just looking at Section 15.5 of the Act, and uh, he's got a copy, but I'll just read it out for anybody who doesn't have one handy. The ombudsperson may become involved in public education for the purpose of informing the public about the principles of administrative fairness and the powers and duties of the ombudsperson. So there, I, I think it lays out fairly clearly that the uh, office would have the, the role of doing some public education. Um, is there anything in particular that you would want to see the office do that's not covered by this clause? Or, um, or do you th think that the government, um, the executive or the, the legislative assembly or whatever has some additional responsibilities in terms of public education? Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Wasselsu. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I, I think that the clause is, is great, um, but the, fundamentally it still may become involved in. Um, it doesn't seem anywhere in the Act that the uh, ombuds, ombuds person office will be resourced with a communications person or a public education person. Um, you know, may becoming involved in it is great, and, and they must be, though. I, I think that's a fundamental responsibility of things that need to happen. Um, and the language here leaves that a bit open. Um, I, I think that's fine, and it leaves a, a good window open of what can be done. Um, but the concern is if it's only a uh, may become involved in, and that's not even may lead that's involved in, which uh, depends on who's starting this public education. At the very least, even if it was uh, the ombudsperson may... Uh, lead public education, may create some public education materials, something very specific, but becoming involved in, I don't really know what circle of uh, public education of this is, is out there for them to become involved in, so. Mr. Rao? Uh, no, that's, uh, that's good, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation coming out this evening as well. I'll, I'll gauge your opinion on the jurisdiction of the ombudsman that, if it moves ahead, would be uh, representing. It'll be totally similar or totally different, in my opinion, compared to the other jurisdictions that Mr. Bale presented. If you take BC, for example, do they have the land ownership uh, with different titles compared to our jurisdiction, we have four land claim settlement areas with a set of regimes to govern the jurisdiction participation in that area. And likelihood of two or possibly three more coming on stream. So the, the political change is, is moving towards, as I said, change. And jurisdictional authorities now, if we create jurisdictional authority 
over everybody, or all 33 communities. I'm just wondering the justification for this cost of this individual. If I'm John Doe from Fort Goodhoe or Polytuck, I can go to my land claim office and say, okay, I've got an issue here and provision number X says you can remedy that for me in your access to this federally constitutional document. So really how busy would this job be? To some extent, we are on our ombudsman in our own jurisdiction. And I visualize the complaints that I received and, and I do get quite a bit, mostly in the, in the area of <coughs> social <coughs> health and education. So I, I, I just want, want your opinion to give some, some more rationale behind how busy this position would be to justify the public dollars it's going to expend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeely. So keep in mind, uh, Mr. Wasseltsu, that uh, we don't expect you to have knowledge of the f uh, financial costs of the office at this time, but uh, to your evidence of ensuring proper resources, mm -hmm. perhaps you could uh, confine the question to those, those parameters. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, to be honest, I don't entirely disagree. Uh, the role of an ombudsperson is, uh, to me, in a small jurisdiction, is, is a little difficult. Um, you've got MLAs with a, a relatively small house, with relatively small government departments, um, and there's quite a bit of access. Uh, you know, even for the public to access, uh, to write a letter to a minister or to find their MLA is quite a bit easier in a jurisdiction here where you represent 2,000 people, 3,000 people, uh, as opposed to, say, federally, where the, an M an MP might represent 100,000 people. Um, the access is very different, so an ombudsperson, uh, I think it really balances out against that. Um, when it comes to municipalities and the level of jurisdictions that, that might apply, um, a municipalities, I think, is, is a very important uh, improvement to the Act. Um, but you're right, as far as the land claims goes and in land claim areas, uh, there's that extra level of government. And how that sort of sits is, is a different piece. Um, an ombudsperson, I know there was some talk previously about other groups being able to use the ombudsperson and that office um, to even sub internally sort of uh, contract it, I guess, to be the ombudsperson under that, under some of the land claims. And I don't know any specifics of that, but that's not a, a terrible suggestion. Um, I think that if you, much like when you build a road, uh, the cars tend to show up and fill it up. Um, not everywhere. Um, if you have another avenue for complaints, I think it will receive more complaints. So it's really tough to judge the volume of, of complaints or, or how busy this office will be until it's there. Um, but I would suggest that uh, if there is another avenue for people to ha have issues and, and their voice heard, they'll take them up on that opportunity. Now, I, don't, I can't speak to what the, the sort of the value of that is. So how many of them are uh, complaints that are, are, worthy, are uh, valid and will end up having change in government? How many issues are, are just pieces that have come around? Um, but it's important to have that resource. So if you create an office that can hear those resources and can hear those complaints, it's very important, I think, that it has um, the proper resources to be able to deal with those complaints and figure it out. I imagine the first year or even uh, two years of that office would really be understanding volume and getting people to know that it's there. Um, the way jurisdictionally it would work with, um, presumably anything that would fall under a land claim would be outside of, of the jurisdiction of, um, of an ombudsperson. Um, as a, you know, as it relates to another government, um, but certainly municipalities, which are creations of um, legislation, uh, can be subject to, to the Act um, and to the Ombudsperson's uh, justifications. I mean, when you have small municipalities, they don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and understandably why it'd be kind of nice to have this extra set of eyes. If you're in a small community government and you only have a few people in your Hamlet office, um, you know, you may not have the time to do that research in comparison to other other municipalities in, in the territory or elsewhere. Um, you might not have a full understanding of the way some of the process worked or, or the way some of it has to work. And so this office could be advantageous in, in those cases. Uh, it could really help out capacity in some of the smaller places. And I would hope that it doesn't create too much of a burden um, for any of the smaller community governments if it's extended that way. 
Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a closing comment. I just wanted your, uh, I, I'm being mindful that I, I represent everybody in this, not to, it, it doesn't matter about their ethnic background. But um, I, I could have used this position in some cases here in the past there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Anything further for our witness? Yeah, hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lucelsi. We will take your evidence into consideration as we continue our review of Bill 20. You may be excused here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our list is uh, Ms. Bissero as an individual. Good to see you back at the witness table, Ms. Bissero. You may proceed <coughs> when ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start with a few comments and then get into um, get into some of the details. Uh, it's long been a belief of mine that the NWT needs an ombudsperson. I'm going to say ombudsperson, ombudsman, because I, I haven't quite got my mouth around the person bit yet. And that legislation has finally come forward suggests that the benefits of an ombudsman for our territory have been recognized, thankfully. As an elected MLA, I began talking about and pushing for a bill like this in May of 2008. I made statements, I asked questions. And I have to apologize, members, I don't have a copy for you, you're just gonna have to listen. I brought up the need repeatedly in my eight years in this institution, at least once a year, but to no avail. In October of 2014, regular members presented and passed a motion to establish an ombudsman office. And in my remarks to that motion, I said, we've been talking about the need for an ombudsman office for years now. There are references to it in Hansard from 1992. There was a proposal for an office as far back as 1993, and a report tabled in this House made recommendations to establish an Ombudsman office. But we have had, unfortunately, no concrete action to establish an office to date. The office is needed. The need is evident. Our territory has grown, and we have grown up. Part of being grown up and being a grown up is recognizing the need to help our friends and neighbours. That's the end of that. So in 2015, as I reached the end of my term in the 17th Assembly, with no Ombudsman legislation in sight, I tabled a draft act for the government's edification. It's taken another three years to see a piece of legislation tabled and now being considered, but I am very grateful that we are finally in this position. 1992 to 2018, it's a long time. Bill 20 is essentially the document that was tabled in 2015 something which is very gratifying to me and no doubt gratifying to the re for the research staff who did so much work on that original draft act. However, I of course have a few concerns and questions about some of the language and some of the clauses in Bill 20 and I want to identify for you some of the language which is missing, so I'll go through my points for you. First off, uh, no particular clause, but the act doesn't specify that the ombudsperson must be a Canadian citizen. And I question if there's any reason for that. It's unlikely we would get a non-Canadian citizen as an ombudsperson, but it's my belief, my strong belief, that they should be a Canadian uh, citizen. And it seems like a small thing, but I think it's an important one. Um, in general, there's inconsistencies in clauses where references are made to the Speaker, Legislative Assembly, Board of Management, and the Premier in one case. So in Article 7.1, um, it references the Legislative Assembly, and that's a good thing. I just have to get to the page. But then we go to 7.3, and in 7.3 it recommends, uh, sorry, it specifies on the recommendation of the speaker. And I think this was referenced earlier, it talks about the commissioner and the speaker. And it, it, if, the urge, if the recommendation is coming from the legis legislative assembly, it should, that should be uh, consistent throughout, that the legislative assembly should be the one who is uh, appointing the person, and if there was somebody who needs to be appointed in their stead, again, it should be the Legislative Assembly. Um, in 8.1, again, it references the Speaker. Um, if they can't act in respect of any particular matter, the Commissioner on the recommendation of the Speaker, again, why not the Legislative Assembly? In 10.1, again, it says the Speaker, and the same question, why not the Legislative Assembly? And I know there's um, a disagreement on whether or not the ombudsperson can hold um, another office. Whatever you guys decide, if you do decide to leave that in there, the approval should not be the speaker. It should only be through the conflict of interest commissioner um, that that approval is given. So um, 
hopefully you'll get the sense that I believe the assembly should be making these recommendations or approvals. It can be easily done in my estimation via the regularly scheduled caucus meetings. In clause number nine, I have to ask the question, what does benefits mean? The ombudsperson is not going to be a member of the public service, and that's appropriate. But it, they need to be well compensated for his or her work, and that includes benefits. So will the ombudsperson be able to have an adequate pension plan, able to access superannuation? And in some cases, um, people have come from government service into a statutory office, and superannuation has been an issue. What about uh, Northern Employee Benefits Service? What kinds of benefits are intended? And I think committee needs to look at that. I don't think necessarily you need to change legislation, but you need to find out if they'll be covered in regulations. And if they are in regulations, what is the government intending to put in those regulations? In Clause 15, 1 and 3, there's no reference to investigating any authority's process or procedure or even policy, and I talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, but practice and procedure are mentioned in Clause 33 2F, and they are, um, are often are the result of a policy decision. So, again, I want to emphasize that act actions by a, an official are one thing, um, decisions by an official are one thing, but if there's no op opportunity, if there's no authority for the ombudsperson to look into practice and procedure and policy, I think it's missing the mark. So it may just require a little bit of amendment to a clause here or there. In Clause 16, 1 and 2, it allows for referral to the Ombudsperson by the Legislative Assembly, a Standing Committee or Executive Council. I feel quite strongly that they sh there should also be an opportunity for referrals from municipal, municipal and or Aboriginal governments. And I'll read you a clause from the Draft Act that was tabled in 2015. A Northwest Territories Aboriginal or Municipal Government may at any time refer a matter to the Ombudsman for investigation and report and the Ombudsman shall A, subject to being able to recover the cost of the investigation from the Aboriginal and Municipal Government, investigate the matter referred, and B, report back as the Ombudsman sees fit. Uh, but sections, da da da, do not, re do not apply in respect of an investigation or report made under this subsection. Um, yeah. Uh, in Clause 17.3, um, <coughs> I question why the restriction, why why there is a restriction on investigations of conduct occurring prior to the act coming into force. I know going back forever is problematic and um, I can see why that may not be, but I think it's quite easy to limit investigations to say one year prior or two years prior at the most. But there certainly are going to be people who are going to have an issue one day before the act comes into force. And I mean, that's always gonna be but at least if you allow them to go back for a year or two years, it's not doesn't quite hurt as much as if you're one day before the act comes into force. Um, in Clause 18.2, um, it's a matter of, uh, of disclosure. I just have to look again because I'm confusing myself here. Um, the ombudsperson can disclose um, that they consider necessary. And I, I question whether this disclosure can be forced for, um, for court or for other um, judicial matters. And I, I, by those I mean <coughs> the types of judicial, quasi-judicial um, arbitrations that um, Mr. Bale was talking about. In clause 20 uh, sub three, it, re it reads that it, you, he, yeah. the ombudsperson may require a complaint in writing, not must. Um, I think I feel that it should be uh, in writing, and I can understand that it, there are instances where a written complaint is not possible. Um, government, I suggest that GNWT government service officers could be used in those situations only to file the complaint, not to do anything else, but to help um, someone who has a written a problem with a written complaint to help them write their complaint. But if not, if a complaint is made verbally or by other means, what steps will be taken to record the complaint to ensure an accurate record of a non-written complaint <coughs> exists? The Act doesn't really um, suggest that if I make a verbal complaint that there's going to be a record of it. If it's written, yeah, there's a record, but if it's verbal, there's not. So I think there's a bit of an omission there. In Clause 32, under notification to the complainant, it doesn't specify that that notification would be in writing. Um, I think there needs to be a record of who was notified in the context of the notification. Certainly if I'm the one who has made a complaint um, and there is, um, I'm going to be notified of that complaint, 
I'm not going to take it verbally, thank you very much. I'm going to ask for it to be in writing. Um, and I think that's not totally clear in the, in the Act. In Clause 33, Sub 1, why is the notification only to the department head? Um, I think there's an, a possibility that um, things can get ignored. And I think if the department head is advised or notified by the ombudsperson, then the minister should also be advised. And 33.1 is contrary to 33, sorry, 35.1, because in 35.1 it reads that the report must go to both the department head and the minister. And I feel strongly about that because there's a need for transparency that can be averted um, if the department head's boss is not advised of what's happened. In Clause 37 one, the reference is to the Premier, the first and only time, I think, uh, to receive a report from the Ombudsperson. Any report to the Premier should also go to the Assembly or to the Standing Committee of the Assembly, maybe not to the Assembly itself, but certainly to a Standing Committee. This again provides for a certain transparency, but confidentiality or confidentially when an authority has not followed the Ombudsperson's recommendations. Lastly, the Act is missing a clause requiring a re review of the Act every 10 years. Over time, the world changes and Acts governing our statutory offices need to be reviewed to see if they still suit the new world, so to speak. And again, a clause from the Draft Act tabled in 2015. The Legislative Assembly or a committee of the Legislative Assembly designated or established by it shall review the provisions and operations of this Act at the 10th anniversary of the date of its coming into force and subsequently at the next session following each successive 10th anniversary of that date. So that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment on this bill. And I want to thank committee and the uh, regular members of this assembly for encouraging or forcing or whatever you did uh, to the 18th assembly and the executive to get this legislation written. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bizarro, and we owe a lot of uh, credit to the work you and your colleagues did in our predecessor committees, and thank you for being here tonight to share your thoughts on the final uh, outcome of this very long journey towards <laughs> an ombuds yeah, for the Northwest Territories. Are there any questions for our witness committee? Well, you made your case very, uh, very clear, Ms. Bizarro. Nope. Oh. One, uh, one question, perhaps, or a series thereof, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah I, I, too, would like to thank uh, my <laughs> predecessor for uh, the work that she did on this, and it must be satisfying to see something finally come forward. But um, I didn't catch all of the... Uh, I was taking notes very, very quickly, and I didn't get all of the section numbers, so... I'm wondering if you have some speaking notes, could, would you mind leaving a copy with the uh, clerk? Because I think you had some really great ideas there that uh, I'd like to make sure that we can follow up on. So if we get uh, Ms. Beezer to leave a copy of her speaking notes with the uh, clerk, that'd be great, but thank you again. Uh, Ms. Beezer? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. O'Reilly. I, I can do that. Um, I'm not leaving these ones because they're on scrap paper, but I can, uh, I can send it electronically. Thank you, Ms. Beesrow. Anything further, Mr. O'Reilly? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Beesrow. You're excused. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Eric Brayton. Eric Brayton. You may approach. Yeah. Thank you. Just have a seat, and then uh, when the mic comes on, you can introduce yourself and proceed with uh, any testimony. Good evening, and thank you for having this meeting tonight. I've just moved from Inuvik, and so it's a timely matter that... Uh, I speak to this committee. I've been a resident of the Northwest Territories. Oh, by the way, I, I could barely hear anyone. I'm a little bit deaf too, but room dynamics make up for a lot of uh, being heard and not heard. But I've been here since 1958. And uh, I remember Stu showing up with the plane load and we had government. For a long time, when I started getting a little bit wiser to the ways of the government, sometimes we call it terrified government, and uh, rightly so, I, I believe that this act is long overdue. 
previous speakers have said it's long overdue. I remember speaking with John Pollard 30 years ago. And now I'm finally seeing some action here. I haven't done my homework because I <clears throat> sort of gave up on the hope that there might be such an act as this one here. But I'm really glad that I, uh, I read about this meeting tonight and that I moved the ally from Inuvik to attend this meeting, besides other reasons. But it's really long overdue, and I, I feel that just looking at the paper here, I see Ombudsperson Act and this table document talk about Ombudsman. I, I think it should be, let's get a little bit more politically correct and call it Ombudsperson. So it doesn't have to be a man. But I have not done my homework as of yet to read th the documents presented. Um, so I, I don't, I can't uh, quote each clause, but I really have to uh, thank Mr. Bale and Ms. Beaverall and other people. And I'm glad that there's no opposition to this, as I believe that perhaps some politicians thought it was a money bill and it would have cost too much. I feel that there's a lot of frustrated people in the Northwest Territories because we didn't have anything with this because of other acts that prevented people making positive suggestions or a legitimate complaint. And uh, I, I am being positive about it, about this, but in my travels throughout the various offices, I sometimes feel that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. I walk into a medical center, one of many, and yet I see a sign, primary care. I walk inside the office of, of the medical centers. And also I walk in the office of uh, education, culture, and employment. And over the past few years, I'm, I really noticed it here in Yellowknife this past week of running around town visiting various governmental offices of uh, there's a, a thick plastic or glass shield with a little hole there. I think with the level of frustration from a lot of residents or long-term residents and newcomers to the north, we are really seeing the loopholes and problems within our government. And never before would I, I thought think that there, there would be a, a little window with thick glass. There's a lot of angry people that, uh, what I think is that uh, people are very frustrated with government. And they re have to resort to yelling because they, it seems though that they've fallen upon deaf ears. And I feel that I have, and other people have many legitimate reasons for it. <coughs> Make it, raising a concern, but you know it's getting scary when you see we do not accept abuse, uh, plate glass windows. That to me, like I said before, to reiterate, to repeat it, so I can, so you can listen and be understand that there is a level of frustration, and people should um, have the right to raise, raise their concerns, but like I said before, perhaps it does resort to yelling, maybe a little bit of verbal abuse, because it's falling upon deaf ears. I, I'm, that's what I think. Um, the language, I think you've had a long time, and this is a long time in coming, but it's kind of watered down. 
it's not really worth the paper it's written on. You know, the power of words, one word, can change everything of yes or no. And within the act itself, I, you know, I think if we can improve upon it in a timely manner, you know, I started looking through it here and uh, it seems though that you want to get rid of the uh, ombudsman right off the bat by the first couple of pages of uh, saying uh, the, the appointment um, holds office entitled to. I, I feel that there's a need for a full-time position because if people raise a, an, a good idea of how the government can save money in certain departments, you could be saving a lot of money even despite the fact that you're paying the ombudsman a good salary. And yes, I feel that the ombudsperson should be a northerner, a long-term northerner that has been in the field, that knows all the players and knows the past history of the government and also have connections with other departments to make things flow nicely while he's investigating. He or she, pardon me. Um, Mrs. Beesrell raised a lot of good points, and this is why I say it's not worth the paper that's written on, is that I feel your lawyers uh, did not do your homework. And so, therefore, I think that changes or improvements to Bill 20 should be welcomed and should be accepted and changed to better improve or enhance. Instead of a review of every 10 years, it should be done immediately when the House sits so that we can uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. Um, I didn't have, I had a couple of other things written down, but let's, now that it's here, let's do the job right the first time. Because if we had stuck, if we stick to this here, I feel that there's going to be a lot of issues and a lot of concerns and problems coming up in the future. And I wish that uh, all your advisors and lawyers had uh, uh, sort of, uh, written a little bit better because, you know, th this, like, say, full of loopholes. But I, I mainly came here, I'm just speaking from my heart and the truth of what I see. I've lived in the North for 60 years. And I certainly see a lot of issues that we can improve upon and fix there are many legitimate complaints or concerns out there. It should be a full-time position and it should also be enacted upon in a timely fashion. Too often I hear that when people have to take you to court to get a decision or to uh, address the situation that the government says, we don't have to respond because it's before the courts. <laughs> Excuse me, come on, be accountable. I'm not mad, but I'm, I want to raise my voice loud and clear so that it does not fall upon deaf ears. And I have to, if I have to repeat it three times for it to sink into you guys to understand something, so be it. But you're talking to a guy that's going, has seen a lot of loopholes. And there, yes, there are many problems, so I think that we need to fix these things and let's do it right. And uh, I, I'm just very glad to uh, have spoken here and I'm very glad that we're finally after, I think I mentioned it 30 years ago and I think there may have been some opposition from it, from certain parties, 
companies or even within government that did not want to be responsive or responsible for their actions. I've encountered a lot of cracks in the system. And besides my health, I move specifically to Inuvik to be closer to the powers that be because I think it's high time that people start speaking up about these matters and I can do it in writing too. I think we need to look, at, look after all the people from all cultures, especially Northerners. I think Northerners come first and we'll worry about the foreigners later. But I think for Northerners, by Northerners is key. And uh, before I start rambling on and on, I, I think I've said everything and I don't, I don't mean any hard feelings. I'll shake any of your guys' hand after this meeting, but um, I think we, the government's got to smarten up. So I thank you for coming, or I, I'm glad I, to be here, and I didn't have anything written or rehearsed, but like I said, I think that there's a lot of frustration out there the way the government operates and some good ideas of complaining maybe for positive things that where how the government can actually be saving money. So just to repeat it, repeat my, the key points is that it should be done in a timely matter, not one year, five years, 10 years down the road. Don't talk about it. You know, talk is cheap, action counts. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, but please don't ask me any questions because I came here to make a statement, really. Sorry, just technical uh, technical issues in my end. So I just wanted to <coughs> address a few of the points you made around the process mm -hmm. with this bill, just to clarify it. And it's not to say, uh, not to correct you certainly, but just to clarify our process so everyone right. understands. So uh, first to the name of the bill, um, over on the, the document table, there's a copy of an Ombudsperson Act, and yeah, that is I've a got, table document. I've got these two. Yeah, so the, the, Ombuds, uh, the Ombudsman, sorry, Ombudsman Act was a table document from 2015, and the committee has provided that to members of the public as a reference document. The bill in consider under consideration by committee right now is the Ombudsperson Act. So your concerns around the uh, gender neutral name, uh, that is the current language of the bill is to say ombuds person. So that, that concern is addressed. And if you review that other document, the Ombudsman Act, the table document, that is not the uh, piece of legislation that we're working on. That's just provided f uh, for reference. So people can see where it started <coughs> in the previous assembly and where, how it's changed since then into the current form of legislation we have before us now. Um, do not be concerned that you uh, don't have anything in writing. If you need the time to look through the legislation, there's still plenty of time to get back to the committee. So I, I very much encourage you to read through it um, in detail. And if you wish after, after that to provide a submission to committee, you can do so by post or by email and uh, the clerk will be able to provide you with our contact information uh, if, if you do want to make a written submission at a later time. You're under no pressure to do right. so. We've taken your, your evidence. Um, and then finally, uh, this committee did not author the legislation. Our job is not to write bills. Our job is to review bills. Um, the authority of the legislature is divided between the executive council, who are ministers and cabinet, cabinet ministers and the premier, and the regular members who serve on standing committees. And one of our key functions is to review the government's legislation mm -hmm. and make improvements as required. And uh, I can certainly tell you that our work behind the scenes uh, has, have, we've identified several issues we would like improved. We have heard um, extensive evidence this evening from members of the public on how we can make the bill better. And uh, rest assured, we will be making those proposals to the minister responsible for this bill. And if the minister agrees, then those changes will be made. If the minister does not agree to those changes, we can still bring them forward 
when the bill enters the floor of the chamber just over there. So there is an opportunity for changes to be made and rest assured uh, that is our role and we are going to do whatever we can to improve the bill uh, before it's passed um, and, and make it the best bill it can be and not well, wait for 10 years. And, you I, know, I really have to commend uh, these people here, Mrs. Beaverall and Mr. Bale. They, they hit the nail on the head with a lot of the language and a lot of uh, words that are in here that could be improved upon. And so I, I think you guys, have, I commend you for doing your homework and you've been in the game. I think Mr. Bale, you were a rentalsman or one time? In another life. I, I could have done a lot of business with you and with Mrs. Beaverall being an MLA. Ms. Pardon Rick, me. Ms. I, 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 tip, just, I it, tip my hat or whatever and, to these and I'm people. Sure, and I'm sure that yeah. our other guests are, right. are very uh, thankful for your compliments. Um, but uh, if well. you've asked that uh, the committee um, kind of uh, not question you too hard, but if anyone would like to ask Mr. Braithen some questions about his evidence, no. So uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Braithen, thank you very much for your submissions tonight. Again, we will take this. You said some uh, very useful things, even if they weren't of a... Uh, technical language. Um, it's important to know how this is going to, how Northerners feel about this, and your evidence is very much appreciated tonight. So thank you very much. You can be excused from the witness table. I, I hope things that this bill isn't that complicated. I've looked at some of the other bills, even within the Canadian government, and they're very antiquated. We're talking about bills like the Parks Act and Inland Waters Act and other acts that date back from the 1920s that still are in effect. I think we need to think of the future and also make it readable that you don't have to be a lawyer to understand what all these words mean here and clauses, subsections, schedules, A, B, C, D. You know, let's have it in plain English, using legalese that uh, someone with an education can at least understand. When you get really tied up in the technical terms and uh, subclause section one, refer to A, refer to B, part of C, you know, uh, it creates chaos and confusion. I, I think here in the territories, we can write something that's understandable and uh, in a bill that's, uh, that people with a bit of an education can understand. Um, and so that the legalese of it, you know, I've encountered situations within government whereas oh go see human rights and I go to legal aid they don't have the right to see me you know I'm trying to get a lawyer and you guys can't even provide me with legal help as to how to proceed with certain issues that are very crucial Mr. Braith, yeah. I'm going to ask you to speak to the, the bill if you do want to provide further right. comment. I appreciate that, that you do have a number of concerns. But, but it is relevant. Well, it needs to be at this time. Yeah. Uh, we, we have given you, I, I think, uh, a great, afforded you uh, enough time to, to speak to the, yes. the substantive issues of the bill. Uh, I, un I appreciate that, that many citizens are frustrated with the level of service provided by government, and that is what this bill is designed to address. But the specific instances of, of those issues with service are not really something we can deal with tonight. No, no, that it's something your MLA can deal with. It's something that all MLAs can deal with. But the purpose of tonight's hearing is about this bill, and I just want to make sure we're speaking to the bill as well, because we do have members of the public joining us tonight. And I, in reference, I'm speaking uh, perhaps not about the bill, but per, we, we really do need an ombudsperson. And I, and I certainly appreciate so I can, your support for an ombudsperson. can mm -hmm. go and get some help and make a legitimate complaint without being turned away or, uh, or 
people have even said to me, oh, it's in the clause, read the bill, read the act. I don't have to do anything. They're, therefore, they're not accountable. And you, and you did hear tonight that the, the ombudsman is an, enabled by the act to participate in public education. And uh, that would be an opportunity to develop some plain language material right. for everyone to understand. Right. Uh, because, and, and I'll just leave it at that, but rest assured that we want to make sure this is the most useful office to Northerners as possible. Well, it's going to be well used. I'll be first at the door. <laughs> but I, th I thank you, and like I say, I'm not, I have no ill feelings towards anyone. I'm, uh, I, I think you guys should be open to criticism a little bit more. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Britton. Does anyone else like to present to the committee before we conclude our hearing this evening? No? Okay. Thank you very much. On behalf of committee, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. As uh, MLAs, it's a privilege to be here and to hear directly from you, members of the public. Uh, when we make our report in the upcoming October sitting of the Legislative Assembly, we'll highlight the feedback we received during these meetings and from other public submissions. If you still have questions about the bill or want to make a written submission, please speak to our committee clerk. You can also visit our website, www.assembly.gov.nt.ca, and all uh, postal or written, or sorry, all written submissions sent by post or email. Our, uh, our deadline is October 8th, 2018 at 5 p.m. I will now adjourn this, uh, the public portion of this meeting. There are some uh, light refreshments at the back, and please help yourself. Um, committee will stay for a brief wrap-up, but we'll give uh, about 10 minutes to the, the public to um, comfortably leave. All right, we are in recess. Thank you. <laughs>